Welcome back to Water Quality in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we're on the uh, drinking water units, drinking water in the USA and the Pacific Northwest. Uh, drinking water consists of five lectures in this class. The components of the drinking water unit include the Safe Drinking Water Act, sources of drinking water in the Pacific Northwest, the public perception of drinking water here in the Pacific Northwest, drinking water contaminants, and drinking water treatment. Today we're covering lecture number 32. Uh, we're going to be uh, continuing to cover part E, which is drinking water treatment. So we're talking about in-home treatment of drinking water, and we're going to talk about the different types of filters a person can use. I'd like to uh, remind you that if you get your water from a public water system, that's 82% of Americans and 82% of the people in the Pacific Northwest, you are assured that the quality of your drinking water at the tap is safe. Uh, for those of you that do not get your drinking water from a public water system, uh, in-home water treatment is probably a good idea. Also, if you get your water from a public water system, uh, your drinking water, uh, there may be some aesthetic things that are wrong with your drinking water that are not health related and you therefore may also look at an in-home filter device. So today we're going to look at the categories of in-home filter devices as we finish up these five units on drinking water quality. The first type of filter we're going to look at are carbon filters. Uh, carbon filters are probably the most common type of filter that people have in their homes, particularly here in the Pacific Northwest. Now, a plus of a carbon filter is it removes most of the organic compounds in water that may cause taste and or odor problems. So if you have a concern about the uh, uh, taste or maybe the odor of your drinking water, a carbon filter might be a nice alternative to add into your home. How effective are carbon filters? Well, it depends. First of all, Carbon filters are just what they say. They have carbon in them. The more carbon in the unit, probably the more effective it is. And also, how long does your water stay in contact with that carbon? If it just washes through the carbon very fast, there's not a lot of uh, time uh, for the carbon to remove the organic materials. So the effectiveness, uh, we'll take a look at a few devices. When we talk about carbon filters, you have a lot of options. Carbon filters, some of the pluses um, or minuses, they have a limited lifespan. You're always going to have to change that carbon filter. Uh, carbon filters work for a while, but as soon as taste or odor comes back to your drinking water, you need to replace that carbon filter. Now, you can buy a carbon filter whose cost would range from just a few dollars to several hundred dollars. And depending on the type of carbon filter, that you buy, you might require professional insulation. So let's take a look at uh, some of the carbon filters that are out, of, out here. Uh, one type of carbon filter is what we call a faucet mounted carbon filter. You mount on your faucet in your kitchen. Another one is called an inline filter where you put it into your water line. Uh, another one is called a line bypass carbon filter. We'll take a look at some of these in a few moments. So we have the faucet mounted, the inline, the line bypass. There's a point of entry where the water line actually uh, enters the house. You could put your carbon filter there. You could buy a relatively cheap uh, portable device that we call a pour-through carbon filter. And then there are other specialty carbon filters. So let's take a look at examples of three of these types of carbon filters that you could actually purchase and put in your home. The first one we're going to take a look at are what we call faucet, mount, faucet mounted uh, carbon filters. They basically attach to the faucet where the drinking water comes out. Oftentimes you screw them into your faucet. Uh, faucet mounted uh, carbon filters contain only a small amount of carbon. And because of that, they're probably not as effective as other types of carbon filters. Uh, let's take a look at a picture of a carbon filter. Here's your uh, sink faucet. And uh, here you have a carbon filter that just screwed into it. 
So when water comes out of your faucet, it runs through the carbon filter, and hopefully that carbon filter would remove any organic compounds that might be left in that water or uh, remove any uh, thing that would cause uh, your water to smell a little bit off. So a lot of people have carbon sink filters. Another type of filter that's uh, commonly seen here in the Pacific Northwest are what we call pour-through carbon, carbon filters. A pour-through car carbon filter works similar to a, a drip coffee maker. It's a simple uh, filter. You basically pour the water uh, through the filter. Uh, they're portable. You can move them around the house. You can take them camping with you. They're portable and they require no insulation. Now, you, again, you can buy a pour-through carbon filter. You can be using it for in your home. You can take it with you if you go to camping or uh, if you have other similar uses. A carbon filter that's a pour-through only treats a little bit of water at a time. And it's probably not as good as remo in removing impurities as other types of carbon filters are. An example of a carbon filter that you've all heard of because you watch television uh, an example would be a Brita filter. Uh, here's a, a picture of a Brita filter taken from a shelf in one of our uh, uh, leading department stores. You take the label off it, and basically what you have is you have a filter system where you have a little cartridge. This cartridge contains carbon, maybe a few other things, and it's right here. You open the top up, you pour your water in, the water goes through the filter, and voila, your water is improved uh, from maybe an organic uh, particle standpoint, maybe from an a odor a standpoint, and the advertiser says, of course, your water will taste better. Now, basically, if we open up this little filter and see what it looks like, it's basically you're pouring water down through it, and basically you have a filter that's got quite a bit of carbon in it. As the water moves through the filter, that carbon is going to take out organic substances. So a lot of people have these Brita type filters. Of course there's some disadvantages with it. Um, one of them is that uh, it, um, it doesn't produce a lot of water. You're basically producing water for drinking or water for your coffee maker. Uh, you're not producing volumes of water like gallons of water per uh, hour or things like that. Let's look at a different type of carbon filter. Um, another carbon filter we're going to call an inline carbon filter. Uh, an inline carbon filter is usually uh, installed built beneath your kitchen sink and it's attached to your cold water supply line. Uh, now once you uh, install this filter you can't bypass the unit. All the water that you get from your kitchen sink is going to go through this carbon filter whether or not you need high quality water for the particular purpose you're talking about. If we look at a diagram of an inline carbon filter, uh, here we are looking below the sink. You see the sink on top here. And uh, basically we have our two water supply lines, one's for hot water, one's for cold water. Basically the carbon filter is attached in line with the cold water. So uh, once the cold water comes up under your sink, it runs through the filter and then to your faucet. So anytime you turn your faucet on, um, your cold water faucet on, you've got treated water that's been through the carbon filter. So basically with an inline carbon filter, only the cold water from the tap is treated. Uh, warm water or hot tap water will, will contain untreated water. But just so you know what it's used for, it can be a very effective device. So we quickly talked about three of the six different types of carbon filters out there. We talked about one that's connected to the faucet. We talked about one that's a drip or pour through. And then we talked about one that you could actually plumb into your line um, under the sink. Now there's three other types. I mentioned them earlier. Uh, you can go and do some research if you're interested in them. How are some other ways that we can improve the quality of our water in our home? Well, we can uh, go all out and buy a distiller. Uh, a distiller produces almost pure water. A distill 
or a distiller will remove minerals, organic chemicals, microbes, and all impurities. It's very effective in treating water. It's suitable for uses that require basically mineral-free water, where you have no calcium, no magnesium, uh, no minerals in your water. And the distillation process most of us are fairly familiar with. Uh, we basically take tap water, we boil that tap water in a stainless steel tank. Uh, as that water is boiled, steam is produced, the steam rises, and as the steam rises, it leaves all the impurities behind in the water that has not become uh, steam yet. Then basically the steam enters condensing coils so that it can be cooled and condensed back to water. And then basically you have a water supply that has no chemicals, no pathogens, nothing in it. And then basically you have a little storage device so you can store the water until you're needed. So distillation is really a fairly simple process. So let's take a look at a diagram here. Uh, basically uh, what you have is you have a, a system where you have the incoming water into your home uh, sitting in a stainless steel tank. You turn on the electricity and all of a sudden the water starts to boil. As the water boils, uh, you've got a heating element here. As the water boils, it turns into steam. Then it enters condensing coils, which, is cool, which cool that steam back into water. And that water that comes out is distilled water, very high quality water. And you put it in a storage tank and you use it as needed. A simpler diagram of a distiller looks something like this. Again, you've got a stainless steel tank. You've got a heating element in here. Your water that you want to clean up is coming uh, into the stainless steel tank. The heating element heats it, boils it. You get steam. It goes through condensing coils. And then you end up with pure water with nothing in it. And then the distilled water uh, has an outlet usually with a storage tank. If we look at uh, the exterior of a, a typical uh, st uh, distillation unit, uh, we can look at this picture right here. Uh, basically, um, the water is plumbed. It comes in. This is where it's boiled, condensing coils here, and you end up with pure water. Now, if you really need pure water, steam distillation will probably produce the best quality water you can use. However, there's a cost associated with it. It's not cheap. If you want to consider distillation, uh, you need to consider how much water you need. And that's going to determine how much this is going to cost you. Because you need to determine the capacity of the boiling tank, the type and size of water storage container you're going to need to store the water after it's been distilled, and the rate at which distilled water is produced. Now, if you're just going to use distilled water for drinking within a home, you don't need a very big unit. However, uh, if you need a lot of water and you're going to use that distilled water for drinking, for cooking, and for a few other things, you're going to need a bigger unit. So you have a lot of things to consider when you talk about dist dis using a distiller. Uh, also, how much do you, how much energy? You have a wattage, you're going to have a wattage rating. So you're probably not going to have your just normal electrical outlet because uh, this distiller is going to suck a lot of electricity. And do you want a batch process, which means you make it when you want to, or a continuous process uh, where uh, your distiller continues to make distilled water at a slow rate, but never really turns off? So you have a lot of things. To, it's, this is a lot more complicated process than buying a carbon filter. Uh, distillation, uh, what size of unit do you want? Large unit produ units produce about half a gallon of water per hour. Small units produce less than a quart of water per hour. And when you talk about boiling water, you're talking about losing a lot of using a lot of energy. So there's quite a bit of cost associated with it. So if we look at distillation cost, it, it depends on the appliance you use, and it depends on your local electricity rates. If your local electricity rates are high, uh, this is a pretty expensive device to produce pure water for you. 
So you have to look at the cost. If you want to go to the highest quality water you can, uh, distillation, you have to play with cost. Uh, distillation units usually cost somewhere between $400 for a small unit and $3,000 for a large unit. The electricity needed to boil water results in high ongoing operating costs. You're going to see your utility bills go up quite a bit. If you only need two or three quarts of high quality drinking water a day in your home, it may be simply cheaper to buy bottled water on a continuous basis. Than to, than to make your own distilled water. So distillation and carbon filters are two of the uh, filters we've talked about. We also have some other alternatives. Let's take a look at them. Uh, we can disinfect our drinking water. Disinfection is probably something that a rural resident would use because you're, if you live, if you get your water from a public water system, uh, the public water system has already disinfected your water for pathogens. So if we take a look at disinfection, disinfection is designed to kill bacteria and other microorganisms. And the primary chemical we use to disinfect the water is chlorine. So basically a disinfection unit is a chlorination unit. It's the most common home method of disinfection. Uh, you can do other things to disinfect your water. They're newer devices, and they're probably quite a bit more expensive. Uh, you could disinfect your water uh, with UV light if you wanted to, but you need space to do that. Or even using ozone uh, would disinfect your water. But buying a system that's available for home use may not be practical. So basically, a disinfecting unit is something that's going to add a small, continuous amount of chlorine to your water. So if your water is not in good shape, it may have pathogens in it. When it comes into the home, uh, you disinfect it uh, with chlorine, and you should have better water. Now, when we talk about disinfection, most of the time, we're talking about a system that continuously puts a small amount of chlorine in your water just like a public water system would do at the original water plant. Uh, continuous chlorination consists of a chemical metering device that feeds chlorine in sufficient amounts into the water to kill the bacteria. Now we know that the chlorine must be in contact with the water for at least one minute to kill. And we want some chlorine in that water. We want a residual level of three to five parts per million remaining in the water to ensure that you have complete disinfection. Now, some people don't like chlorine taste, but it will protect you. Disinfection will protect you from pathogens. Uh, there's plenty of information out there on disinfection of water in the literature. Uh, people that have wells, sometimes they want to disinfect the water in their wells, and they do a process called shock chlorination to disinfect the wells and all the water pipes coming into the house. There are really good procedures for this. All you have to do is Google shock chlorination and you can get a tremendous amount of information. And when we talk about chlorination for a homeowner, we're usually talking about using regular bleach. Uh, and if you're gonna do shock chlorination, uh, you're gonna use bleach in the process. Okay, another in-home water treatment device uh, that people often talk about, and a significant number of people here in the Pacific Northwest own, is a water softener. Uh, one of the problems some homeowners have with their water is that it's considered to be hard water, which means that there is a lot of calcium and magnesium in the water. Now remember, calcium and magnesium are not health hazards, uh, so they are not removed from your water in your water treatment plant. Hard water, however, does some things that some homeowners do not like. Uh, one of them is that the hard water interferes with some of the things we do every day. It interferes with laundering. It interferes with washing dishes, bathing, and sometimes personal grooming. So basically, hard water is also, uh, it's a pun intended, uh, it's uh, hard on appliances. The Hard water chemicals, cal calcium and magnesium, build up in water heaters, and they build up in other appliances that run water through them, so they reduce the life of the appliance, 
and they can increase the cost of heating if the appliance is a, is a heating appliance or a heating unit. So if people have hard water and they're worried about laundering and bathing and, and uh, there's some things that uh, water with high levels of calcium, magnesium have in it that are undesirable properties, uh, we can modify or remove a lot of those um, chemicals uh, by using a water softener. Now, how hard water is basically water with high levels of calcium and magnesium. And hard water is reported in grains per gallon or milligrams per liter or parts per million. When you take hard water and use it with soap, it causes soap deposits that will not dissolve. Water softeners will alleviate the negative impact of hard water use. So if we take a look at a water softener, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get rid of the hard water. Water is softened in a water softener by passing our regular water supply through a bed of ion exchange resin. And what happens when this, uh, when, when, it, when the water passes through an ion exchange resin? Uh, it exchanges the calcium and magnesium in the water for other things. Uh, oftentimes, sodium is one of the ions that replaces it. Basically, when you run water through a water softener, you're adding about 15 milligrams of sodium per gallon of water, or per gallon for each grain of hardness that is reduced. Now, there's a lot of information in the literature on water softeners, and you can go there and you can look at them. Here's simple, uh, simply a diagram. Uh, basically, uh, you have the water softener, you place it between uh, your appliances, such as your water heater. It's usually out in your garage. Uh, incoming water lines go through it. Um, you have to have salt and it, uh, sodium chloride uh, to uh, make the exchange resin work. Uh, if you plumb in a water softener in your home, uh, you want to be uh, sure of two things. You want the, uh, the hard water that's coming into your home you want it to bypass your outdoor faucets for watering your lawn because you do not want to water your lawn with softened water that contains some sodium. So there's a lot of information in the literature that you can uh, find out about water softeners. Again, my goal was just to introduce these concepts to you. Another type of filters are called fiber filters. Uh, fiber filters are, fi are filters that are full of cellulose or rayon. And what they do is they remove suspended sediment from your water. If your water is turbid, uh, you would probably use a fiber filter in your ha home. And basically, all the sediments would be trapped by these filters. Basically, what happens is you have a filter uh, that contains the cellulose or rayon and the water moves through this filter. Water pressure forces water through, this through the tightly wrapped fibers of this filter, and basically when the water goes through this filter, the sediment is left behind, and you should end up with clearer water. Fiber filters come in a variety of sizes and meshes, uh, depending on what you need. Uh, you can get uh, filters that are very fine to filters that are coarse. Uh, they're Based on micron ratings, the lower micron ratings are finer. So if you really want that water clear, you get one with a finer rating um, because finers, uh, finer uh, cellulose uh, filters uh, trap a lot more particle and your water will be clearer. Uh, now, the, the finer filters make water quality better, but you're going to do a lot of maintenance because those filters have to be changed uh, fairly often. Some of the problems with fiber filters are they may not remove, remove all your contaminants. If taste and or odor are problems, the fiber filter will remove the sediment, but you probably need to line it up in line with another filter, such as a carbon filter after the water has passed through the fiber filter. So you would have these filters in tandem. Now, basically a fiber filter has replacement car, uh, cartridges, and these cartridges will range in price anywhere from $12 for a small 
uh, fiber filter to maybe $900 if you have a very elaborate system. You're on your own private water system. Your private water system happens to be surface water. Your water is pretty turbid. Uh, you're going to have to uh, use a lot of fiber filters uh, to clean up that water. So again, these fiber filters come in a variety of sizes and a variety of meshes from fine to coarse, from lower micron ratings, which are better, uh, micron ratings being finer, finer filters trap more particles. So if you have problems with turbidity, and again, we're talking basically about private water uh, system supplies, uh, you might consider a fiber filter. Finer filters make water quality better, but the filter must be changed often. And filters do not purify or soften water. Filters just remove sediment. They don't purify water. They don't soften water. They just remove sediment. So again, fiber filters will remove some suspended particles. Uh, they'll remove some, dispended, uh, some dissolved organic compounds. But basically, you're removing sediments. If we take a look at uh, examples of home fiber systems, uh, fiber filter systems, uh, here's a system that you would probably put under your sink. The water would run through two or three filters, uh, coarse filter, medium-sized filter, or finer filter to remove all that sediment. Uh, you can uh, look up on the internet on how these fiber filter systems work. There's a lot of people that sell these filters, and they are pretty effective. Uh, you can buy a, a home three-month fiber si system that uh, basically will treat 100 gallons of tap water over a three-month period, and then it's worn out, and you have to replace the filters in it. So you only really want to run water through your fiber filter that you're going to consume for drinking or, or maybe cooking. Uh, this is not a, it's going to cost you quite a bit to uh, treat a large volume of water to remove sediment. We still have other water treatment devices, probably the most popular one coming up, what we call a reverse osmosis unit. They're often referred to as RO units, and reverse osmo uh, osmosis units remove a variety of inorganic chemicals. They can remove nitrates from your water, they can remove calcium, they can remove magnesium. And uh, most reverse osmosis units are very effective. They'll remove up to 95% of the uh, inorganic chemicals that are in your water supply. So reverse osmosis units uh, really have a lot of uh, pluses. Unfortunately, uh, reverse osmosis units can also remove beneficial chemicals from your water. They uh, they don't have the selectivity. For instance, uh, if your uh, local public water system um, treats your water with fluoride and you t move that water through a reverse, reverse osmosis unit, it will remove the fluoride from your water. Reverse osmosis units are very good. They work very well, but they're not cheap. Uh, so it's usually only used to treat your drinking water and probably the water you use for cooking. No way would you want to spend the money on treating water that's used for bathing and things like that. Now, a reverse, a reverse osmos, osmosis, osmosis unit is actually pretty simple. Uh, what it does is it contains a pre-filter that would remove any sediment that would happen to be in the water. Then it has an activated carbon filter to remove odors and taste. And then the reverse osmosis unit itself is a semi-permeable membrane through which water flows under pressure. So to make that reverse osmosis unit work effectively, uh, you have a pre-filter to remove the sediment, so that's probably a fiber filter, and then an activated carbon filter to remove odors and to improve taste, and then the reverse osmosis unit, which is a semi-permeable membrane. So you not only need that, you need a tank to hold your treated water. And then you need a drain connection 
so you can discharge the concentrated contaminants that don't go through the membrane, that the membrane prevents from going into your actual drinking water supply. So reverse osmosis uh, is, is actually state of the art. It works very well. Um, why doesn't everybody use it? Simple answer is that it's pretty expensive. So here, what, here's what uh, a semi-permeable membrane looks like in this diagram. Uh, you see the uh, membrane right here where the arrow is. You've got the incoming water on top, and then you apply pressure, and that water moves through, uh, water goes, flows through the membrane, and very few particles, only about 5% of the particles actually get, or ions get through that membrane. So basically the reverse osmosis unit traps 95% of the things. So you have a higher contaminant concentration that doesn't go through the semi-permeable membrane and the lower contaminant concentration. So a reverse osmosis unit works pretty good. Now when we say a reverse, reverse, reverse osmosis unit has a drain, and that's to take away this concentrated um, water that has uh, more contaminants in it. Very uh, simpler diagram of a reverse osmosis unit. Uh, basically what you have is uh, you have water. You can actually uh, take salt water and, and bring it up to drinking water quality if you put in a high quality semi-permeable membrane. So basically the incoming water supply, you apply the pressure, you have the semi-permeable membrane here, and with the pressure, the water will move through the membrane, and basically you have fresh water that's removed 95% of the contaminants. Now, if you want to see how a system like this is plumbed in a home, uh, you know, you can plumb it under your sink, you can plumb it many places. Uh, basically, uh, here's a fairly complicated uh, system where uh, you have a pre-filter, the water's coming in from the home. You have a pre-filter. Uh, let's say we're removing sediment. The second pre-filter removes carbon. And then basically you go through the reverse osmosis unit right here. Water comes out. It goes into a storage tank. And then you use it as needed. Uh, you either use it right away or you use it as needed. So uh, you can see that this is a pretty big system. It can be a pretty big system in size. It can be complicated, but it's very effective. Now, if you're interested in a reverse osmosis unit, uh, different sizes are available. They can be installed under the sink or in a remote location, depending on the size of the holding tank you want. And uh, if you're interested in a reverse osmosis unit, you need to match the holding tank capacity to the number of gallons of water that you, high quality water that you would use a day. So as you're considering a reverse osmosis treating in treatment unit, um, if you've got a household that has four people in it and you're using your reverse osmosis unit primarily for drinking water and cooking, uh, a household should be able to get by on five gallons of high quality water that's treated with by uh, reverse osmosis uh, a day. A unit is expensive. You're going to pay somewhere between uh, $650 and $1,600. Uh, if you don't want to buy it, you can always rent an RO system. There are a lot of companies that do that. But the initial cost is not all you've got. You've got maintenance costs. The membrane needs to be replaced on a recommended schedule. Eventually, you clog up that membrane. It wears out, and you need to replace it. Uh, you need to weigh the cost of the system. Sorry, I just have an O instead of over here. Against the type and the amount of contaminants you're, that you're concerned about from a safety standpoint. And because reverse osmosis is relatively expensive, you need to compare the cost of bottled water, five gallons per day, to the expense of a reverse osmosis unit. In some cases, if you're a very low water user, user uh, it's cheaper to buy bottled water. Now, again, you're not going to need a reverse osmosis unit if you get your water from a public water supply system because all the, the compounds that are considered to be unhealthy for you are already removed. We have another type of system I just wanted to mention. Uh, it's a neutralizing filter or a chemical feed pump. 
Uh, some people want to adjust the pH of their water. For most things that people use water for, water should be close to a pH value of 7. Extreme pH values, either too high or too low, are corrosive. They're not good for your water system. They're not good for your porcelain in your home. They're not good for your pipes. So if your water pH is too acid or way too alkaline, you may want to consider adjusting the pH of the water using a neutralizing filter or a chemical feed pump. So adjusting the pH is not uh, very uh, difficult, very simple, uh, very simple system. You have a neutralizing filter that the water runs through to change the pH of the water to what is desirable. Extreme pH values, pH values too high or too low, they can cause metals to leach from plumbing systems such as uh, our pipes, a lot of our pipes are put together with lead solder. You don't want that lead leaching out and being in your drinking water supply. They also form scale in your pipes. Uh, your pipe diameter gets smaller and smaller with time. If you see, how do you know if your water is too acid or too alkaline? Well, you can have it tested, but some of the clues are um, you might see blue-green stains on porcelain coming because of copper plumbing. The water is so acid that some of that car, copper is leaching out of the plumbing and depositing it on, it on your porcelain. You might see red stains coming from galvanized uh, plumbing. Uh, that galvanized means that it's zinc coated. And then the following materials can be used to adjust water upwards. You can buy granular calcium. Uh, you can buy magnesia. You can buy sodium carbonate. You can buy sodium hydroxide. All of these chemicals are acceptable to put into chemical feed pumps to adjust your pH to optimum levels for your water needs, drinking, uh, cooking, and your plumbing system in your home. Now, if your pH is too high, uh, there are chemicals that you can use to adjust your pH downward, although almost everybody uses a dilute sulfuric acid to adjust pH downward. So this briefly in this lecture is just simply going through uh, our, our different options we have to improve the quality of water within our homes. If you decide that you need to improve the quality of drinking water in your home and you want to buy a treatment system, always test your water prior to purchasing a water treatment system. Because your water test will tell you what's wrong with your water and then you need to match what's wrong with your water to the correct treatment system. You probably should consult with local health officials, equipment manufacturers, or suppliers to match your problem with the correct solution. Also remember, there is a treatment system for everybody out there, but before you purchase an expensive treatment system, consider lower cost alternatives. And yes, if you're talking about a system that may cost you thousands of dollars, bottled water is a it's an alternative if you're only going to use five gallons of water a day. Or if you have a private water system, you have your own well, and there are a lot of problems wa uh, with the water in your well, it may be cheaper to drill a new well into a different aquifer. And finally, if you're on a public water system, that's 82% of us, don't purchase expensive treatment systems. If your water just smells bad, you can buy one of those simple carbon filters as a pour through. Uh, you don't need to spend a lot of money because your, the quality of your water is already excellent. Thank you for your attention. Uh, that concludes our five units uh, talking about drinking water uh, quality in this course. Thank you. Do you want the system to automatically turn on when your supply of distilled water gets low? Or are you willing to turn it on when you need it? And then you have to figure out where you're going to locate 
the unit. The unit is not really small. So uh, you want to locate the unit uh, for convenience of use and ease of maintenance. So you don't want it sitting on your kitchen sink. Then a distiller uses a lot of it.